So I want to welcome everyone first to 2024. Um, and it's not just that, it's mid-January. So um, and I say that more or less to kind of scare myself, but um, about how quickly 2024 is, is um, not on its way, but kind of halfway through January. But it's a, it's a, a wonderful uh, occasion both to welcome all of you to the KPP um, seminar today. Uh, there is a work in progress series that happens on the Thursday. So this is a, an extra event in that regard. Um, and I can't think of a better way of starting 2024 by welcoming our colleague Rob de Groyters. Um, this is a, a work that you've done with your colleagues um, and it's called Life Course Trajectories and Wealth Accumulation in the United States, Comparing Baby Boomers and the Millennials. Um, it hit the press big time, actually, didn't it, Rob? Uh, and, yep. Um, and I, I must say that uh, this is almost one of your last occasions here in the Faculty of Education because you'll be moving to my old university and my old um, faculty or, or school, Faculty of Education, I think it is still called. Um, so uh, at the end, we'll wish you well. But uh, to begin with, um, thank you so much for agreeing to present this. This is absolutely the kind of thing that um, all of us in the cluster are particularly interested in, where we're looking, uh, Rob's a, a sociologist, a quantitative sociologist, um, and has done uh, some fabulous work. There's a paper that accidentally uh, you included, but do look at the latest paper um, on um, Rob and colleagues actually looking also at the OECD's um, latest efforts on social and emotional well-being. So um, a, tre tre a treasure trove of really good works. But Rob, over to you. So thank you. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Susan, and um, thanks, Adam, for, for organizing, and thanks for everyone else here for, 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 for having me. Um, yeah, so as most of you know, I am uh, an associate professor here in the faculty, and I'm affiliated with um, the Real Center. Um, so my current work is mostly about education in the global south, uh, which is quite different from uh, the paper that I'll be presenting today. So. This paper actually originates from even before my time in the faculty. So this has been sort of work in progress for the last six years. So you can imagine sort of the cycle that some projects go through. So first of all, it was like a massive data compilation effort, uh, just getting all the data ready to in the kind of format where we could analyze it. Uh, and then, of course, like the writing and then the revision process just took years and years. Like it's been going through revisions for the last three years. It was accepted more than a year ago, but then they took another year uh, before it finally came out. So it came out, uh, yeah, finally uh, last year, uh, November in the American Journal of Sociology. And yeah, the topic is uh, sort of speaks for itself. So it's about life course trajectories of uh, millennials and baby boomers in the United States and, and how those life course trajectories are um, associated with wealth or economic uh, outcomes. So it addresses a kind of uh, very uh, common question that uh, we continuously uh, come across in the news, but also, you know, it's a private topic of people's private conversations and so on. Like are millennials really the first generation that is worse off than their parents. So there is this uh, yeah, article in the, in the Financial Times a couple of years ago who claimed that, and yeah, we regularly see these kind of alarming reports in the media about millennials not being able to buy homes, uh, having precarious jobs, uh, not being able to get married, uh, not being able to move out of their parental home. So we all know these kinds of narratives, right? And sort of, it's very much linked to the sort of generational tensions in society because these millennials are, of course, often juxtaposed to the baby boomers who have it all and who had like an easy time and it was easy for them to buy houses and sort of get on the wealth ladder. Um, and so they've hoarded all the wealth and, and they're not sharing it with them. So that's kind of like the big narrative, right? So millennials are doing terribly and like the baby boomers, they, they had it so well. Um, but some people also question that. So there's, for example, this uh, recent uh, uh, um, article in the in the Atlantic, which is based on a book by uh, an American author, uh, Twingy, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, 
um, where she claims that actually this is all wrong and millennials are actually doing fine. Like if, even if they had some hiccups due to the financial crisis and so on, now, now they've recovered. And so she argues that they are, uh, that they're thriving. So uh, it's not everybody who buys into that narrative that the millennials are, are doing worse. Um, so yeah, so we thought like we want to sort of empirically investigate this. And so we don't have any sort of a priori assumption as to, you know, what we are likely to find. Um, and we noted that, you know, um, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry this, yeah, this is, like I said, we, we, we try to investigate that empirically uh, in the context of the United States. Um, yeah, so this is what I just said, right? So millennials are assumed to be, you know, having all these difficult uh, uh, um, outcomes, both in their family domain as well as in their employment domain. So insecurity, precariousness, and so on, instability, uh, and all of that sort of in the context of rising wealth inequality across the board in the United States. Um, so yeah, the general sort of um, discourse is that they are not doing so well. Um, but similar concerns were raised about the baby boomers when, when they were like in their 20s and 30s. So let's say in the early 90s, um, there was a similar discourse about, you know, there's so many of them, so they're all entering the labor market at the same time, so they have to compete for jobs, it's going to be really, really hard. And there was actually this article uh, in 1993, uh, it's like, will the baby boomers be less well off than their parents? So, like, it's very much sort of a re repetition of that discourse. And, yeah, according to that article, I mean, at the time in 1993, the prevailing sentiment was also pessimistic. And then, of course, it turned out that in the end, they, they, they turned out pretty well. Again, not all of them. So that's sort of um, our next main point where we want to challenge a little bit uh, that idea of like looking at averages from one generation to the next. And instead, we want, we're saying, uh, what we're saying in this paper that we need to pay more attention to intra-cohort differentiation. So basically heterogeneity within cohorts, like who is doing well and who is not doing well. So obviously it's not true that all baby boomers are wealthy or that they're all doing well. And, and neither is it true that all millennials um, are, are, have precarious work and are unable to buy houses. So some of them, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, is a millennial or Sam Altman. So they're obviously doing pretty well. And, and so are many others. So we have to pay attention to intra-cohort differentiation, which is a, a kind of, yeah, this is a long-standing uh, principle within life course research. Uh, another, of course, uh, long-standing principle in life course research is cohort comparison. So this classic article by Ryder in the 1960s says, um, comparing the careers, whether that's employment careers or family careers, of people who are born at the same time, so they have the same age, let's say people born in the 1980s, they obviously have the same age uh, today, and then comparing them to people, let's say, who were born in the 1960s or in the 1950s. And by comparing them at the same age, we can study so how social change happens. Because obviously, if we're comparing people at different ages, we have confounding by age. So people get wealthier with age simply because they have had more time to accumulate and so on. So that's another principle that we want to put into practice. And then, of course, a final core principle of, of, of the life course approach is to look at life courses as longitudinal sequences of different states. So rather than looking at point in time outcomes or, or single variables, like is the person married or not? Um, um, let's say, uh, does the person have a job or not? We look at those careers as a sequence. And I'll, I'll show you in a, in a second um, how, we, how we do that quantitatively. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about the background. So the specific questions that we ask in this paper are, um, how does the distribution of household wealth at age 35 uh, differ between millennials and baby boomers? Um, how do early work and family, so by early we mean from 18 to 35, so relatively early, like early adulthood, not, not early uh, in the entire life course. Early, uh, early work and family trajectories differ between millennials and baby boomers. Um, how do the wealth return so that the payoffs of different trajectories, uh, different work and family trajectories vary between millennials and baby boomers? And then finally, 
to what extent can any cohort differences in wealth, so differences between baby boomers and millennials in, in wealth outcomes, be attributed to changes in their work and family life courses? So maybe they have less wealth because you know, they're less likely to get uh, stable jobs or because they're more likely to be single parents and so on. So that we can also assess. Um, yeah, so we very much talk about the relationship between these life course trajectories, so work and family trajectories, and uh, wealth accumulation. Um, and there's different ways in which, of course, life course trajectories can relate to wealth accumulation. And we identify four um, theoretical mechanisms. Um, it's important to mention that we are not actually able to distinguish between these four mechanisms. Um, and I actually think it is impossible to empirically distinguish between the four mechanisms for various reasons. Um, but we do think that they all play a role. Um, so the first one is, is treatment. So this relates to um, what we call the direct wealth enhancing effect of work and family trajectories. So for example, the most obvious example, if, if your work trajectory is characterized by having a very high paid job, then that's obviously conducive to saving money and therefore accumulating uh, wealth. Um, so that's what we call the treatment mechanism. Then facilitation, um, when wealth enables transitions or provides access to certain trajectories, or conversely, when certain trajectories are blocked or complicated because of a lack of wealth. So an example here would be um, if you're wealthy or if you receive a wealth transfer from your parents, you can use that to pay for education. You know, in the US, especially college is very expensive. So if you don't have any wealth, it's very hard to attend college, or maybe you might be forced to go to a community college, for example. Um, and of course, being able to go to college opens other possibilities, uh, careers, obviously, but also family uh, trajectories. So many people obviously meet their partner in, in college. Um, so that's what we call facilitation. Um, uh, then uh, selection. So... Um, it could be that we observe an association between, uh, let's say, work trajectories and wealth because people in work trajectories are selected based on certain background characteristics like um, their, their ability, their, their, their cognitive skills, or perhaps their socioeconomic background. That obviously also has an effect on their ability to accumulate wealth. So in that case, it's not sort of the causal effect of the trajectories themselves, but that these people in, in these trajectories, they differ based on some um, prior um, characteristics. And finally, a discrimination. Um, so when uh, employers or parents or others um, exhibit bias against or in favor of certain uh, life course trajectories in ways that are relevant to wealth accumulation. So here you can think, for example, about uh, the motherhood penalty literature in, 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 in wages, but also maybe your parents cut you off because they disapprove of your family choices, so these kinds of things. Um, so these are the four mechanisms that we, um, yeah, that we consider, even though, as I said, we're not actually uh, able to distinguish between the four, and therefore we also don't interpret our findings as like the causal effect of um, um, uh, life course trajectories on wealth because the causal effect would be just this. I mean, this is actually um, reverse causality, so wealth affecting your trajectories rather than the other way around. And, and these two are obviously also not uh, uh, causal. So uh, that's important to keep in mind, it's associations rather than causal relationships. Um, yeah, so a little bit more on the ways in which wealth outcomes might vary between baby boomers and millennials, right? So from one cohort to the next, why might we observe um, differences in wealth outcomes and how might that relate to um, these work family trajectories? So one possibility is that there might be a change in the prevalence of certain trajectories. So millennials might be more likely uh, to engage in trajectories that are either conducive or not conducive to wealth. So, for example, maybe they are more likely to remain single, which uh, we might hypothesize is probably not very good for wealth because when you're in a couple, you can sort of, there's economies of scale to that. Uh, similarly, uh, if they have more precarious uh, and low paid work trajectories, then for obvious reasons, that would also be not conducive to wealth. So, if we see um, a shift in these trajectories across cohorts, that could potentially 
um, affect uh, uh, wealth outcomes. Um, but another possibility is that it might be related to the returns to otherwise similar trajectories. So if you think about like a, ma a married couple who are both uh, teachers, so that would be a middle class trajectory, um, or, or, or they are both, um, uh, let's say, a cleaner, so it's sort of a working class trajectory. Um, so they do the same thing, they have the same family trajectory, but their wealth outcomes might be different in each cohort. So it might be that such a trajectory uh, was, um, had a better, a higher payoff in terms of wealth amongst the uh, baby boomers compared to the millennials or vice versa. Uh, and here we actually, uh, we are able to distinguish between these two um, possibilities. And then a little bit on the sort of broader macro structural context. So this is a paper about the US uh, looking at sort of trends over the last 40 years or so. So this was obviously a period of big uh, economic restructuring. So the decline of manufacturing um, and the rise of the service economy and especially sort of the, the low skilled service economy uh, was a big uh, uh, thing that happened during this period. Uh, also what uh, demographers call the second demographic transition. So the decline of sort of traditional family forms characterized by um, heterosexual marriage and early parenthood and the rise of sort of many alternative family forms uh, like single parenthood, um, delays in uh, um, fertility or people deciding to remain uh, childless, as well as increases in uh, sort of divorce and thereby um, family complexity. Um, so this is all uh, well documented. And also there have been a major social policy and tax reforms, which are evidently uh, relevant to wealth accumulation. Like for example, the, uh, the tax cuts of, of George Bush and, uh, uh, and Trump, which, which had clear benefits for people uh, with high levels of wealth. Um, and so Taken together, we, um, for reasons we explained in more detail in the paper, we assume that these three uh, uh, um, trends were um, not good for millennials. So they probably led to adverse compositional life course change. So more, they were, would be more likely to engage in life courses that are less uh, conducive to wealth accumulation, as well as polarization in the wealth returns. Uh, for the millennials relative to the baby boomers, which is indeed uh, what we find, as I'll show you uh, in a second. So empirically, we use uh, two surveys, which, uh, yeah, like I said, were a nightmare to work with because they're really badly, uh, they're not very user-friendly at all. Like they just give you a bunch of raw data. So I spent probably like a year, like a full-time work that's just cleaning this data and getting it into a shape where we could actually analyze it. Um, but the data is very rich. Um, so they follow uh, two cohorts of, of people, uh, yeah, basically throughout their life um, from early adulthood to, uh, to, to now. So these surveys are still ongoing. Um, so yeah, they're a bit similar to like the millennial, millennial cohort study in the UK. So um, there's the NLSY 79 which were people born between 1957 and 1964. So these are at the sort of later end of the baby boomer uh, generation. Uh, and they were first interviewed in 1979 and those interviews are still ongoing, um, if, if they're still alive, of course. And uh, so that's about 7,000 people. And then the next uh, one was started in uh, 1997 with a cohort of people born between 1980 and 1984 so these are the early millennials. So they are relatively the older millennials. So normally people say the millennial generation sort of starts in 1980 until like 93. So uh, yeah, that's why we talk about uh, late baby boomers and early millennials. And yeah, so we have about six, six or 7,000 cases in each cohort. Um, and obviously our main outcome variable is wealth at age 35. So we're comparing them at the same age um, so wealth is essentially their assets minus their debts of the respondent as well as their partner if they have someone. Um, and then we look at their family employment trajectories which were derived from very detailed monthly calendars of, of what they were doing or what family state they were in at any point in time. And we use sequence analysis and clustering to, um, to create clusters of different trajectories. And I'll show you in a second how that works. And then we control for um, 
yeah, fixed characteristics like uh, race, gender, and parental education. Um, uh, of course, it's really interesting also to see how these life course trajectories and wealth obviously hugely varies by race as well as uh, uh, gender, but I mean, that's not something we delve into a lot in the paper. Um, my co-author has some other papers that look in, that, at that in more detail. Um, yeah, so this is what the comparison looks like. So we follow, yeah, these two generations, they are about uh, 30 years apart. So we can broadly say that these are approximately the parents of these ones, although it's obviously not their actual parents. So they are randomly sampled. Um, so just to see where in historical time we observe them, right? So this is where we observe them. So this is where they become adults. 90s, like basically in the 90s, depending on when they were born. And the millennials, so they're born in the early 80s, so they were 35, so they're between 2015 and 2020. So that's where we measured their wealth. And of course, they are all affected by, you know, economic shock. So we've listed sort of all the recessions here. So we see the millennials were affected by, obviously, COVID, um, uh, by the Great Recession of 2008, the dot-com recession of the early 2000s. Um, but the baby boomers as well, like the oil crisis and so on in the 70s, like those are also, you know, big economic uh, shocks. So they also, it wasn't that like they were universally experiencing sort of economic prosperity. That was clearly not the case. So yeah, again, just for context. And uh, yeah, so we use uh, sequence and cluster analysis to identify, um, sorry, that's an, yeah, to identify like typical employment and family trajectory. So of course, every individual's uh, employment trajectory is different and family trajectory as well. Um, so, but we try and create sort of groups of people who had typical like similar trajectories uh, using a method called sequence uh, analysis. And then we compare those uh, trajectories to wealth outcomes um, at age 35 uh, to look at, yeah, again, changes in the composition of trajectories as well as changes in the returns. And then uh, we do this decomposition, which, uh, yeah, it gets a bit complicated, so I'm not going to show that here because I think actually the descriptive findings are the most interesting um, to, uh, to look at. So, yeah, this is uh, what uh, the idea of sequence analysis, essentially it comes from uh, genetics, so like the human DNA has this like sequence, right, of different, I mean, there's, uh, I think there are proteins, I, I'm not a biologist, but they are often um, visualized in this way, right, as like a, but so the idea which some people uh, came up with in the 1990s, uh, actually someone called Andrew Abbott, very famous social theorist, um, he said, well, we can actually also apply this to human life courses, so if you think of your employment career, you know, let's say uh, if you go to university, you would start like this starts from age 18. So maybe you would still be in school. Then, you know, a couple of years of university, let's say until 23. And then, OK, so this person was lucky. So immediately out of college, they they got into a professional career, like maybe a lawyer or a medical doctor. And they stayed into in that until 35. So they basically had only two states, so college and then professional career. Um, other people, uh, they might have much more transition. So this person also went to college. Then they had a period in uh, doing sort of skilled manual work. Then they had a period out of the labor force. Then they went back to college. Then they had sort of a series of jobs in different sectors, right? And, and other people, they might have no change at all. So this person was constantly in the army. You know, or this person was constantly uh, an unskilled, low-skilled manual worker. So there were no changes in their sort of, um, yeah, class, it's essentially a class trajectory. So rather than, a, rather than individual jobs, these are the, the class to which we can, social class to which we can uh, allocate those jobs. Um, and, and similarly, we can do that <coughs> for family trajectories, right? So here, the different states would be um, living in the parental home, living in the parental home with children, uh, single, again, with or without children, Cohabiting, um, cohabiting with a partner, again, with or without children, uh, married with or without children, and separated with or without children. So here a, tip, a trajectory could be, 
uh, living in the parental home and then moving out but still being single or, or being married with children throughout, so someone who already had a child when they were 18. Um, or, yeah, or various combinations of that, right? Um, so it's a similar idea. So we do that for both the family and the employment life courses. And then once we create those clusters, uh, so we cluster the similar ones together. And in the, when it comes to the work life course patterns, we find uh, 10 different clusters. So oh, this thing's very sensitive. Uh, so the, um, and a lot of them, they cluster roughly according to different classes, right? Which is not surprising. So this is a cluster of people who basically went to college and then had like higher, the most prestigious sort of professional jobs. Um, this is a cluster of people who had mostly low skill jobs. So for obvious reasons, you also see that most of them did not have any period in, in college. And also you can see, for example, here that they are much more likely to be interspersed with unemployment or time out of the labor force compared to the more professional um, clusters. And we also find a mixed low skilled cluster. So these were people who had extremely precarious, were constantly shifting in and out of work, sometimes low skill service work, sometimes uh, uh, manual work, as well as a, a, a military cluster and a cluster of people who were predominantly uh, not working. Um, for the, uh, yeah, and so if we look at how frequent, how common those clusters or those life trajectories were in each cohort, um, so the millennials are the red bars and the baby boomers are the blue bars. So one obvious thing to see is that this cluster, which is characterized by higher professional work, so like lawyers, doctors, university professors, um, there's like a really big decline there. So like that's really huge from like 18, 17% to just about 7%. On the other hand, we do see an increase in lower professional work. So this would be like social workers or um, primary school teachers. So that has increased. Um, and we see a, a huge increase in lower service work. So this could be like waiters or uh, uh, cleaners, uh, caregivers. Um, and uh, a slight decline in, in, in low-skilled manual work. So yeah, quite big changes in the sort of typical employment trajectories. And also, uh, yeah, we see changes in the family trajectories as well. So we, uh, we find eight clusters of family life courses. Um, so early marriage, late marriage, um, childless marriage, uh, cohabitation uh, with children, uh, uh, single parenthood, so obviously with children, um, divorce, rel uh, re relatively early marriage, and then followed by divorce before age 35, uh, singlehood, and, and a cluster of people who just mostly stayed in the parental home uh, uh, until their 30s and uh, mostly didn't have uh, children or partners. So this is how that changed across the two generations. So uh, a huge decline in everything that's characterized by marriage. So especially early marriage has about halved. Uh, early marriage with children. Uh, late marriage with children has also declined. Uh, marriage without children has roughly stayed the same. Uh, unmarried parenthood has increased a lot. Uh, so these are all things that we kind of know, right, in the U.S. context. Um, and also uh, singlehood. So this kind of confirms to the stereotypes about the millennials, right? So they stay single longer and, and a larger number of them stay in the parental home for, for a long time. Uh, yeah, but so this one is, of course, again, quite, quite striking. Uh, and so is this one. And then this is the distribution of wealth. Um, so these are uh, uh, quantiles. So this is someone who would be at the 10th percentile of the distribution. So um, at the lower end, so the poorer ones. And these people are at the 90th percentile of the distribution. So they are um, yeah, at the upper end of the distribution. So there's only 10% of people who are wealthier than them. And this is the median. So this is median wealth, so uh, exactly in the middle. And so, of course, the first thing we see here is, as, as we know, wealth is, is re hugely unequally distributed in each generation. So the people at the top, they have a lot of wealth, like 
$500,000. Uh, and the people at the bottom, they have almost nothing. So actually, people in the lower half distribution have almost no wealth. Like maybe they have like a car, like that's worth like a couple of thousand. Um, and, and then we also see uh, some change across generations where uh, at the lower end, the millennials have less. So the poorest millennials, they are poorer than the poorest baby boomers. Um, but at the upper end, so the wealthiest millennials, they are wealthier than the wealthiest baby boomers at the same age. So essentially, this shows that inequality, which was already very high, has increased even further. And if we look at sort of the median, which is of sort of the typical person, also has like a bit less. Uh, and it's only around the, yeah, the top 30% that are doing better. And of course, the very top is also interesting when it comes to wealth, right? Like there's the top 1%, even the top 0.1%. But because this is survey data, uh, we are not actually able to observe that. So they have actually kept to protect the anonymity of the respondents. Uh, but it's likely, I would suspect that at the top, it's, the gap becomes even bigger. So, so yeah, so that's the descriptors of our independent variable, the trajectory, and the dependent variable, the wealth in distribution. So now how does these two things relate to one another? Um, so oh no, first, no, a little bit on the distribution of wealth. So we see that a lot of wealth is home equity. Um, so a big reason for, I think, the increase uh, uh, for the problems of millennials is that their home ownership rates have declined. So it's only the people at the top of this who have some home equity, whereas for baby boomers, it was even in someone in the, at the median would have some home equity at least. Uh, also, their debts have increased a lot. So a lot of that would be like college debt probably, but also things like credit card debt. Um, and then at the top, like financial assets, it's mostly financial assets. So people are very wealthy, it's not necessarily physical things, but it's like yeah, financial investments, so companies, and so on. Um, yeah, so how do these um, wealth returns differ across cohorts? So here we see, um, like again, for the, at the bottom, so the 10th percentile, the median, and the 90th percentile. And I think, yeah, so the interesting thing here is like at the, at the bottom, right? So um, uh, we see that uh, some of those uh, 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 people in like the prestigious directors, they are actually in debt. So this is probably college debt. So these are people who are actually, um, you know, they have a good job, but they still haven't paid off their debts at age 35, uh, which is quite common uh, uh, among uh, baby boomers, uh, among millennials, more so than among baby boomers. But the, the most interesting thing is here, right? So at the top, we see that those who are already in, you know, prestigious trajectories, like, like higher professionals, uh, as well as these like technicians, people who, as well as people who have late, uh, late marriage and children, which is kind of a typical middle class family trajectories, they are really the ones who are sort of doing better compared to the previous generation. So it's the, yeah, the, the, the group of millennials who are doing better are the ones who are at the top of the wealth distribution and who have these kinds of middle class or upper class uh, work family trajectories. Um, and it's often the ones who have sort of working class trajectories who are, who are doing uh, worse. Yeah, so this is just to, to summarize those findings. So yeah, it's a very big paper. Um, so we find in terms of distribution of wealth that the poorest millennials are poorer than the poorest baby boomers, but the richest millennials are richer. Um, we also find substantial difference in the life courses themselves. So a shift from higher to lower professionals, uh, service and technicians, as well as a shift from uh, marriage-based trajectories to trajectories that are characterized by cohabitation, singlehood, and non-marital parenthood. And uh, so this is, I think, probably the main takeout of the paper, sort of a polarization in wealth returns to what we call like middle class and working class trajectories across cohorts um, where there is yeah, an increase to these kind of like middle class trajectories, especially at the top um, and, uh, and often lower wealth or indebtedness for service class and, 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 and um, other sort of typical working class trajectories. So yeah, what we, um, 
if, if there is sort of a key message like coming back to that sort of narrative about who is like better off are millennials really doing worse off i would say it's kind of the wrong question like it's kind of a bit misleading question because the question asks about averages right it asks about are they doing better like across the board but when you think about wealth you've seen how unequally distributed it is so if you take the average of that it's kind of meaningless right if you take the average wealth between me and let's say mark zuckerberg yes it's very high but it doesn't say very much about my, my wealth you know uh so yeah so averages can hide discrepancies within generations i think that's kind of maybe the key message here um so instead we should ask uh, which millennials were better off or worse off than previous generations um and so yeah we observe that kind of polarization and we make some suggestions as to you know what we can do about this and essentially there's like two types of you think about how to address um wealth inequality there's policies that lift the bottom so that enable people to accumulate wealth in the first place we're not currently able to do so so that has to do a lot with housing policy um because housing is for most people their most important asset um as well as access to stable and decently paid work uh and healthcare so especially in the US is not a given that people have access to healthcare so that can often be a reason for indebtedness and that can throw people off um yeah uh, of of a sort of otherwise promising trajectory and then the policies that level the top so this has to do with reducing and redistributing very high uh wealth outcomes so that relates to obviously taxation uh and as well as inheritance tax so obviously a lot of wealth is inherited wealth um yeah so yeah we're coming to the dissemination so because it paper speaks to a very sort of um a popular topic that that is already in the news a lot uh, i think yeah it was very easy for us to sort of get attention from the media also tom uh, tom kirk our media officer was extremely helpful in this um so we wrote like a press release uh which then got picked up by a lot of american american media special of course because it was about the us um so uh yeah this is some local news station who even did some like vox pops with like people i already asked them on the street that was quite interesting uh and then like yeah usa today and sort of and then yeah i think once it is in when it's out there then a lot of them sort of copy each others because there's these media aggregators so yeah it's got very widely distributed um in the US um unfortunately they often use that framing of are they better or worse off rather than what because our point was actually well this is kind of not really the right way to ask that question so yeah that's the i guess that's the downside of like public dissemination that it's really hard to get the finer point of the study across and people tend to go yeah it can be potentially like misinterpreted but i mean i guess the fact that they engage with start with with data and with economic research is 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 as such is is a good thing and yeah i think my favorite was this like um uh like local radio station in seattle who had like a whole discussion about the findings i don't know if you want to listen to it for a couple of minutes